welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time it's the second part of our introduction to Blender, where we're going to look at adding surface materials to objects and rendering still images and animations. In this video I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the Blender interface and basic modeling techniques as I covered in our first episode. So let's go and get started. Right, I've just launched Blender and here we have the default scene which has got a cube object, a light to provide illumination and a camera. And if we want to see what the camera is seeing we can click on the camera icon over here like that and we can zoom it in if we wish as well like that. We can even move it around if that makes us happy and at any point in time we can toggle from this view back to the user perspective by clicking the camera button like that. And if we want to make a render of what the camera is seeing, we can go up to Render and uh, Render Image, although we can also press F12. I'll use the menu this time, but otherwise in the video I'll press F12. And as we can see, we now have our first Blender render of a grey cube. But what if we want to change the colour and the surface properties of this cube? Well, to do this, we'll close down the render window and select our object, and go across to Properties over here, and we will scroll down in Properties all the way down here to Material Properties. And I'll also resize this area a little bit to give us more space to work with on the screen. And at the top here, we can see the material currently assigned to our cube object, which has the default name Material. But if I double click there, we can change the name. I think I'm going to call it Main Cube Surface, like that. And if we scroll down here, we can open up a preview. There we are. We can see a preview of the material currently on a sphere, but we can also preview materials on a cube like that. We could preview on hair, which is uh, rather exciting. We can preview on a blender shader ball. We can preview on fabric, and we can even preview on a fluid. Although for now, I'm going to go back to a sphere because most of the time it's best to preview things on a sphere. And if we scroll down a little bit more, we can see that our material is by default based on a surface shader called Principled BSDF, where BSDF stands for Bidirectional Scattering Distribution Function. And as we can see if we scroll even further, there are lots of different things we can change for this shader, masses and masses of potential inputs, and everywhere here we can see a little dot, it means that the value here can be controlled by what's called a node. And I'll demonstrate nodes in action later in the video, but for now we're just going to make some changes here in the Properties panel to prevent things getting too complicated too quickly. So I'm going to first click on the base colour, and we'll drag that down to, uh, let's have a red object, that's always fun. And I'm also going to go down to Roughness, and this is a setting for how a material scatters light, and I'm going to set this to 0.1 like that. And if we now go back up to our preview, you can see we've got a glossy red sphere, that's very exciting. And if we press F12 for a render, there we are, we've now got a red cube. Although, as you've probably noticed, it doesn't appear glossy. And it's also the case you might have noticed that we can't see the colour on the cube in our 3D viewport. So what I'm going to do is to press Control and Spacebar like that, which just allows us to see all the controls for the 3D viewport. I'm going to go along here to change the shading from solid to Material Preview. And I'd point out you can also change it to Rendered, which is more accurate, but it's also slower. So I'm going to stick here on Material Preview. And we'll press Control and Spacebar to restore our display areas. Next, let's transform this cube into a more interesting object, which will render out more realistically, as it's never easy to get a great render with so little geometry. So what we're going to do is to go into Edit Mode like that, and we'll pull out our tools as we did in the last video, and we'll pick up the, uh, the bevel tool, and we'll bevel the edges of our cube like that. We'll open up the callout, we'll set the segments to say 7, I think that'll be OK, that looks fine to me. We'll go back into uh, object mode, and we'll render again with F12. And this is a little bit more interesting, although as you can probably see, we can see the individual faces on this render. So I'll come out of this again and go to the object and I'm going to right click 
And you'll see at the top, we can set it to be either flat shaded, smooth shaded, or we can set it to auto smooth, which is what I'm going to select here. And what this does is to smooth out the edges of faces that intersect below a preset angle, for which the default is 30 degrees. So if we render again another F12, there we are. We get a nice, glossy, red, round-cornered cube. But you may cry, what if we want different parts of our object to have different surface properties? Well, we can, of course, do that. So we'll go back into a edit mode, I think, for the object like that. And we'll press Shift Z to toggle to wireframe mode. And if we just uh, rotate around a little bit like that, let's sort of zoom in as well, get a bit closer so we can work a bit more easily. We'll bring it around a bit like that. What I'm going to do is to go to faces in terms of our mode, and we'll use our selection to select, hopefully, all the faces there around the, uh, the edges of the cube and we'll use a Shift Z again to go back into the Material Preview mode. Next, go back to the Properties panel and scroll up to the top, where what we're going to do is to add a new Material slot. How do we do that? We press plus on here, and we get a new Material slot. And you might be thinking, what's a Material slot? Well, think of it as being a bit like a groove that holds a coloured pencil, something like that. There's no material in this yet, but we can add a new material, we can add a new colouring pencil by pressing new, like that, and lo and behold, we've got a new material. And I think we'll call this one cube ring, like that, and we'll scroll down here, we'll change the base colour to something sort of yellow orange something a bit like that. We'll go to metallic, and then to a value of 1, and we'll go to roughness, and then to a value of 0.3. And if we now scroll back up to the preview, you can see we've got this goldish metal type material. And if we now press the assign button, it will assign that to the selected faces on the cube. And note we have select and deselect buttons here. So for example, we could go up to the first material, we could select that, we could deselect that, we could deselect the cube ring material. And do note that these buttons here, assign, select, and deselect, are only here in edit mode. If we go back to an object mode like that, those buttons disappear. So if you ever lose them, that's where they've gone. And of course, if we now press F12 for another render, we can see we've got a cube with two surface materials. This said, it's a bit dark around this edge, so we'll uh, try and sort that out. There's loads of ways we can do that, but we'll do it nice and straightforwardly. I think what I'm going to do is to press the key below the escape key, that's the tilde key on a US keyboard, like that, just so we can select a view. We'll select a top view, like that, come out a little bit, and over here we've got a light. Let's just move things around so we can see everything, what's going on, even a bit more like that. There we are. We can see we've got a light there, object and camera. What I'm going to do is to press Shift D to duplicate the light, drag it over here like that. We've now got two lights in our scene. Go away, requester, I don't want to see that. And we'll adjust the power of this light. We've duplicated from a light, it was 1,000 watts. Let's make this one, say, uh, 750. Don't want to have two lights exactly the same. We'll have a little bit of variety in our lighting. And if we now press F12, hopefully with, yes, that's a much better lit object. But I think we can do even better. I'm going to close that down. I'm going to go into Properties here to Render Properties there. And if we go all the way to the bottom of Render Properties, we find Color Management hidden away at the bottom. And down here, there's some critical controls. The first one is View Transform. And by default, Blender applies a filmic look to its renders, which is a strange thing to do because it makes them slightly washed out. So we're going to apply Standard. And you'll also see here, we can control exposure, which is a bizarre control because by default, it's at zero, which is really 100%. If I give, for example, a value there of 0.3, that's a 30% increase in exposure. And if we now render again, and yes, I think that now looks a little better. Now, when working with materials, things can get more complex when a scene contains more than one object. And to demonstrate this, I've set up a sphere, which has got two materials allocated to it, as we can see up here, sphere AA, and a stripe that goes around it. And if we add another object to this scene, if we go to add mesh and add another UV sphere like that, and I'm going to set this to be shaded smooth because it's a sphere and they generally like that. And if we look across to the Material Properties panel, you can see we can't now see any materials. 
And this is because the Material Properties panel shows us the materials for the current object. So if we click back on the first object, we can see its two materials. If we click on the new object, there are currently no materials to display. Now, if we wanted to, we could just add a new slot and a new material in it, as we did in the last part of the video. However, alternatively, we can click here to open the Material Browser, and this will show us all the materials currently being used in the scene. And because we've got our second object selected, I can go across the Material Browser and, for example, click on Sphere AA, and it will allocate that material to our second object. You can see it's added a new material slot and put the material sphere AA into it. However, do note that this material is now shared between our two objects. And that means that if we edit this material, if I go down here, for example, to change its color like that, let's change it to a yellow, it's changed the material on both objects because it's the same material. And sometimes you might want that to happen and sometimes you might not. And here, I don't want it to happen, so we're going to press Ctrl Z to return things to their previous state. And what I'm going to do is to go back to the material Sphere AA, make sure it's selected, and I'm going to click on this control down here. And this will create a new material based on the current contents of that slot. So if I do that, like that, you'll see the name changes. I'm going to call it Sphere BB. That would seem a sensible thing to do. That's rather logical. And now, if I altered, say, the color of this material, we can do that without actually changing the, uh, the previous object. And that's a very useful thing to be able to do. Often you want to be able to take a material, use it again, but maybe with a different color or some other slightly different quality. It's also worth noting that we have functionality to copy and paste material settings. So, for example, if we go back to our first object over here, and we go up to, for example, the stripe, we can go to this little down arrow, and this is called Material Specials. I don't know why it is, but if we click on it, you can see we can copy a material, and I could now go back to the other object, and we could go to Material Specials again, and uh, Paste Material, and lo and behold, the material settings are pasted across. And I want to make it clear that here I've been working with whole objects, but if we went into edit mode, we could copy and paste materials or create new materials, all the things I've just shown you, at the level of selected faces, just as we've now done for complete objects. So far, we've manually allocated materials to objects or faces. However, the Boolean functions we used in the last video can work with materials as well as geometry. And to illustrate this, I've created this beveled cube, which I've called Dice1, which has got a material called Dice AA. And earlier, I had a fun time positioning 21 spheres in an object I've called Markings. I'll turn it on like that. There is Markings. And as I'm sure you've guessed, we're going to use Markings to mark the numbers on the dice. And the material for Markings is set, as we can see if we go down here, to be called Dots. So let's turn off the view of markings in the viewport like that and select our dice object. And we'll go down there and we'll add a modifier, which is going to be a Boolean. And we're going to select an object, which is obviously going to be markings like that. And there we are, the geometry has been altered. We've got the markings now in our dice, but we can't see the material, but do not panic. We can go to solver options and we can select transfer materials. And yes, the materials have transferred. That's rather cool, isn't it? And here I'm actually going to apply this boolean like that, and we're going to get rid of the markings object. We're going to delete it, pressing delete. And we now have a final dice object. I'm rather pleased with that. That looks uh, rather good. And if we press F12, there we are. We've got a lovely render. It isn't quite perfect yet. The lighting's not quite right, but I'm fairly pleased with that. And as you might have noticed, if you've been looking at the scales here, this is a rather large dice. It's actually a two meter cube. So it's the kind of dice that elephants roll with their trunks when playing Monopoly. And as you may know, these always come in colored pairs. And so I'm going to select our object and we'll do a Shift D to duplicate it. We'll press X to constrain and we'll move it a bit like that. There we are, let's just come out a bit so we can see things like that, that looks uh, pretty good, isn't it? Let's move across, and uh, yes, things are coming together already. And I want to have 
dice two a different color. So let's go and sort that out. Let's first of all call it dice two, like that. And we'll go to its materials down here. There are its materials. We'll select dice AA. We'll uh, make another material from that and call it dice. I'm sure dice BB would be a good idea. There we go. And if we now go down here, we can change the color and it shouldn't change the other dice. I've got this right. Hopefully it won't. What should we color should we have? Uh, or oh, a purpley one. I think that's pretty good. And I'm now going to roll and reposition our dice like this. There we go. And we'll now have a look through the camera. That's not exactly perfect, is it? So uh, I think what we'll do is go to a top view. Let's do it that way. There's a top view. And we'll just come out uh, like, like that. Where is a camera? Over there. I just think I'm going to reposition the camera a little bit. I think I'm going to get it nice and uh, level because uh, the camera's always in a daft position initially in Blender. I don't know why they put it uh, in a position where it's at 45 degrees. Let's just get it basically leveled up. I always start like that. When we've got it somewhere roughly sensible, we can then start to working with it like that. And if we now take a view from the camera, I've missed the objects entirely. Deary me, let's see where it's gone. There we are, and we can now rotate in the appropriate direction, which is not that one. There we go. This is getting a little bit better, isn't it? Camera positioning in Blender is not something I'm a great fan of, I have to admit. There are all sorts of ways to do it, none of which are uh, perfect, but that's, uh, that's getting pretty good. And it's worth noting with camera settings down here as well, where we can change things like the focal length of the lens. Let's just come out a little bit like that. I think that's probably uh, about right. So let's try another render. And yes, I'm pleased with that. The well, lighting still needs a bit of work, but I think I'll have fixed it after this into title. Well, I've now tweaked. We've now got three lights illuminating our scene. Lighting is a topic I might come back to in a whole future video. But for now, we're going to move on to rendering and saving still images. And to help us do this, it's worth clicking on this icon here, the Blender Output Properties icon, where, as you can see, the default render resolution is 1920 by 1080. And we could change these values if we wish, or we could select from one of these presets. Although for now, I think we'll stick with HDTV 1920 by 1080. And as you know, if we press F12, we generate a render. And it's worth pointing out this is a 1920 by 1080 render on a 1920 by 1080 display, so we can't see all of the image. So it's always a good idea to zoom out a little bit just to check your image is exactly what you want. And if it is, you can then go to Image and Save. And by default, Blender saves images as RGBA, that's RGB with an alpha channel, in PNG format. Although, as you can see, lots of other formats are available. But for now, I think I'll stick with PNG RGBA. I'm going to call my image, I think, test six for consistency with the images I've been saving already. And there we are. That's all there is to it. It's also worth noting, though, that still images can be rendered to a number of slots. Currently, this image is in slot one. We could, for example, pick slot two. And the reason I picked another slot is because so far we've been rendering over a mid-gray background, which is not always what we want. So how can we change the background color in Blender? Well, in theory, it's very easy. We just go across to world properties like this. We can see the background color there. We could change it, for example, to white like that. And we could press F12 to render. And there we are, that's the result. Let's just compare it to the previous result like that. As you can see, a couple of things have happened. One is the image is massively washed out, and the second is our white background isn't completely white either. So what can we do about these things? Well, we can fix the second one of those issues very straightforwardly. It's something I actually showed earlier, but I thought we'd show it again to make it absolutely clear. We'll go back to Render Properties, scroll all the way down, and make sure that the view transform is set to standard, not filmic. I changed it back just to show you this effect. But if I now render again, we will see, there we are, Blender has used the background color we actually set. But what about the impact on the rendered image? What if we don't want our background affecting the look of our objects? Well, we could, of course, just change our materials and the lighting in the scene. Or, for a very pragmatic solution, what we could do is to go back to our background colour down here, put it back to roughly what it was somewhere 
about there. And if we go back to render properties and we scroll down, we go down to film, you can see there is a little option to click transparent. And if we do that and we render, there we are, we've rendered our objects against the transparent background. And if I got the gray roughly right, they look pretty similar to how they did previously. We could therefore save that image, go across to an image editing application. I've got GIMP open here. We could open it up. There it is, like that. It's got a nice transparent background, which means here in GIMP we can add another layer like that. We can uh, color it in any color we wish. And there we are, we've got what I initially intended, our rendered objects on a white background. Alternatively, we could go back to Blender, like that, and we could untick Transparent, and we could change our render engine. There are two main render engines in Blender, EV and one called Cycles. And Cycles produces slower but more realistic renders. And because it's slower, I'm going to go down here and set a time limit for our render to 10 seconds, although I'll probably speed through the renders anyway. And if I now press F12, there we are, it's doing a cycles render. Let's let it complete. And this looks pretty similar to what we had from Eevee. As you can see, I didn't get the gray exactly right, but it's a pretty good match. And if we now change the background color, let's go back to world properties and change it, for example, to a white background. And if we now render, Oh no, you cry, everything is washed out again. It is. However, because we're now using the Cycles Renderer, we can go down in our world properties to Ray Visibility. This isn't here if we use the Eevee Renderer, and we can turn off Ray Visibility for everything but the camera. And if we now render, that's more like it. We haven't had an impact on our objects from the background. And to really prove it, let's go back to slot one, and uh, change the color of the background again. Let's change it to black. We couldn't do a bigger change than that, could we? Let's render again. There we go. And we've got our objects now rendered over black and over white. And the objects, as you can see, don't change. And having this black background has given me an idea. What I think I'm going to do is to add a ground plane. So let me just quickly do that. And it wants a material, of course. Let's give it a material. We'll add a slot, we'll add a new material, we'll call it um, Flective Ground, I think. And I'm going to use here the glossy BSDF surface. I'm going to set the roughness to roughly 0.15, in fact, actually 0.15. And if we now render, yes, that I think looks rather cool. Although I don't like these particular little uh, glares, reflections there. So let's get rid of those. Let's go back to the uh, object properties for that go down to its uh, visibility in terms of rays. We'll turn off, I think, glossy. Let's try that again. Yes, that's going to give us a much better result. And as you've probably gathered by now, using Blender, like using any other 3D modeling package, is all about rendering, making tweaks, rendering again, till you get the best result. Right, let's now move on to controlling material properties using nodes. And as we saw earlier, over in the default principal BSDF shader, we find lots of different settings. And the reason for this is that this shader allows us to control multiple surface layers, including base, specular, sheen, and clear coat. And if we look across to the Blender manual, we find there's a very good page on this shader, which explains all of the different properties we can alter. And there's also some very useful renders or very useful diagrams to allow us to work with it most effectively. And of course, I'll provide a link to this page in the video description. Now, if all of these controls over here seem a bit overwhelming initially, the first thing I would say is that when you're starting out, you could just alter base color, metallic, and roughness. Or, if you wanted to, you could switch to a simpler shader. So, for example, you could use Diffuse BSD or Glossy BSD. And this is very glossy right now. Let's make it slightly less glossy by pushing the roughness up a little bit, like that. Now, whatever shader we use, each material property has got a dot against it called a socket, to which we can attach further control functionality known as a node. So, for example, if we click on the color socket, we could add I don't know, we could add somewhere up here, there's a brick texture. 
That's exciting, isn't it? The mortar's a bit dark colour there. Let's make the mortar a bit brighter. That's nice, isn't it? We can make the bricks maybe red and uh, I don't know what else. Make, make them blue. We can do all sorts of things in computer graphics. You get the feel of that. Or if we want, we could add an image texture. We go up to image texture there and then we open up an image to put onto our object. Let's find one in textures. Let's try, for example, tarnished railway brass. This is a picture I photographed of some tarnished railway brass many years ago at the National Railway Museum in York. And if you're wondering exactly how an image texture is applied can be precisely controlled, although I'm not going to cover all of that here. Rather, I'm going to remove this texture, which we can do by going up like that and pressing remove, and I'm going to change our shader to glass BSDF. And I think I'll set the color. Where's it gone? Let's just scroll up a bit. The colors come back. There we are. We'll set the color to, a, say, a, a bright pink. And if I now press F12 for a render, we have a glass dice with painted dots. I like the, the impression of the other dots through the material. That's rather wacky, although it's a little dark and hard to see with such a smooth surface. So let's make a few changes. First of all, let's go to color, and I'm going to select here the brightness contrast node. Very, very useful node. Let's put it back a sort of pinkish color, but I'll increase the brightness here. I think we'll go about 0.6. I think that'll be okay. Maybe 0.65. I'll be wild. And then after that, I'm going to add a node to our normal control here. And this is going to be a bump node. And initially, this will do nothing, as we can see. But if we scroll down here and we add a node to bump height, and this is going to be a texture. We can find it at the top here. Come on, Blender shows the whole lot. There we are. I'm going to use, I think, a noise texture. And by adding this bump node and a noise texture on top of it, what this has done is to give us the illusion of height displacement on the surface of the object. And if we adjust our settings a little bit, and if I press F12 for a render, I think we've now got a rather interesting result. Although I think it's a little bit red for my taste there. I want it a little bit more pinky. I'll move it back towards pink for the next time we render. Anyway, so far we've been working with nodes here in the Material Properties panel. But for even more control, we can use the shader workspace. And we can access this at the top of the screen from a tab, except we can't see the tab here because of the interface scale factor I've got in place. But if I take my mouse up there, hold down the mouse wheel, the middle mouse button, I can scroll across and we can go to the shading tab. There we are. And that's just to push this out of the way. The screen gets a bit cluttered with this lot going on. But basically what is happening here, let's just scroll it up a bit like that. You can see we have got our glass BSDF shader and you can see we've got our brightness node controlling the color. We've got a bump map node controlling the normals and we've got the noise texture controlling the bump map node. So what we're seeing here is a graphical representation of what we've been doing over here. Where are we? Let's just pick up our object like that and uh, go down there and hopefully... Yes, there we are. I found what we were doing. That's good, isn't it? This is what we're working on. What we see over here is exactly what is reproduced over here. And if we want, we can add nodes in this space directly. So let's just go back and uh, go to our other object. Let's go to our first dice and let's go to its... Uh, Colors, let's pick up its top color. Well, we've already picked it up. That's rather handy. And let's, for example, give it a texture. We can go to add and texture and we'll use an image texture like that. Drop it into place. We can now drag from its color output across the base color of the object like that. And we can select a texture. I've got here some uh, concrete I once photographed and messed around with in Photoshop. I do photograph interesting things at times. You can probably see at the top here, we've now got that on the object. And just to be really exciting, what I'm going to do is also go back to our pink dice, pick up those particular nodes there and copy, and then go to the dots, which is shared by both dice, if you remember, and we'll just paste those in place. And we'll then scroll down a bit and we will attach the, uh, the normal output of that to a normal of that. That'll just give a bit of texture to those dots. And I know I've done this rather quickly and things are getting a bit confusing on the screen, but I just want you to make you aware of the possibilities when we start to work with nodes in this fashion. Anyway, the most important thing to do right now is to press F12 and do a render. And there we are. I think that's moved things on rather nicely. Before we started experimenting with nodes, our dice looked like this. And now they look like this. 
And my final piece of advice about working with nodes in terms of textures is to experiment. You've got to experiment with Blender, get a feel of how the different controls work to get the best results. Now, the final thing I want to cover in this video is rendering an animation. And obviously animation is a massive topic, but I can here at least demonstrate the workflow. And as you can see, I was getting a bit fed up with our dice, and so I've loaded in another test object. This is the graphics card from my Explaining Desktop PC hardware video. And as you can see over here, this has got lots and lots and lots of materials. Anyway, turning our attention to animation, I've got a camera set up, as you can see, and if we go to Output Properties, we can see the frame rate by default is 24 frames a second. I'm going to set that to 25, which is what we generally still use for video in the UK. And if we go down a bit down here, we can see our frame range is currently set from 1 to 250 as a default. I'll leave it at that. That'll give us 10 seconds of animation. And then lower down here, we need to set up the output. I'm going to set the folder. It's going to be, I think, in there and uh, there. I've got a render directory like that. And we mustn't forget to put in a file name. I think I'll call it graphics card test. And I'll put an underscore on the end because Blender will add frame numbers to each file it renders out. We're rendering here individual frames. So we'll just accept that. There we are. And I'm going to render out PNG files, but not with an alpha channel. So we could now go to the menu and go to render and render animation. But it wouldn't be very interesting because nothing would move. So let's pull our timeline area up so we can see it a bit more clearly on the screen like that and select our object and go to its properties like that and scroll up to uh, the top of properties where what I'm going to do is to set all of the location and rotation values to be animatable like that. And as you may be able to see over here in the timeline, we've now got a keyframe at frame one. So let's now press a little button over there to go to the end of a timeline like that. And I'll now reposition the graphics card. I think that will be OK. Let's just bring the timeline back into view. And now down in the timeline, I'm going to press I to insert a keyframe on all channels. And if we now press play, yes, we have some actual motion. It's worth rendering this as an animation now because something will actually happen. And so what we will do is to do just that. We'll go to render and render animation and it'll start off the process rendering out the first frame and then the 249 after that, which of course will take a bit of time. And so I'm now going to go and make a cup of tea. And here I am back again a few hours later. Frame 250 is just completing. There it goes. We've got all our frames rendered. And if we go across to the folder they've rendered into, there we are. We can see we've got 250 frames. And if we bring up a video editor, I've got DaVinci Resolve waiting to sort all this out. It's going to Blender Tutorials, Render. There's our PNG sequence. Let's drop it down there. Go across to our timeline, drop it onto the timeline like that go across to deliver. It's all set up. So if I click render all, it should render out our shot. And uh, there we are. It's done it. So if I can now find the folder where it's gone, I think it's there. And theoretically, there we are. That is our shot. I've demonstrated the workflow rendering a Blender animation. In this video, I've just scratched the surface of using materials and making renders in Blender. However, hopefully I've covered enough to get you started and to allow you to experiment further. In future Blender episodes, there's all sorts of things I could cover, including more advanced modeling and surfacing techniques, and maybe things like using particles to create visual effects. So if you've got a particular request of what I should cover in my next Blender video, do let me know down in the comments section. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon. Hey.